Welcome everyone uh, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Katie Baxter and I'm the Supporters Manager here at Support Through Core. Uh, we're really thrilled to be hosting this event and it's going to be a fantastic evening. Uh, so thank you very much to both of our sponsors as well, our Family Wizard and Three Paper Buildings Barristers for supporting this event. Uh, just before we get started, um, I'd just like to let everyone know that there will be a Q&A portion of the event after the main discussion where we will take audience questions. So throughout the event, please do send in your questions via the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom or the right hand side of your screen. And then we'll get to them later and try to answer as many as possible. Uh, we'll also be hearing short book readings from both William Clegg and Sarah Langford after the Q&A portion. Uh, so please do make sure you stay on to hear those. Thank you again for joining us and I'll now hand over to Matthew Paris to get the event underway. Thank you. Good evening everybody. I'm uh, Matthew Paris. Uh, my, my little crib sheet here says introduce yourself. Well, I was once a Conservative MP. Uh, I was once a television presenter. I am now a radio presenter and I write for The Times newspaper and The Spectator magazine and, and that I think is enough about me. Uh, I, I'm going to be trying to sort of chair the discussion, but I've never done one of these things before, so be, be gentle with me, all of you. And I will ask first Sarah and then William Clegg QC to introduce themselves. Thank you. I'm Sarah Langford. I'm a criminal and family barrister, and uh, I am the author of a book called In Your Defence, Stories of Life and Law. Um, I do not come from a legal background. I uh, grew up with parents who uh, were a primary school teacher and a land agent, and our life was very far removed from the legal world. And so um, when I set off on my legal journey, it was because a friend of mine encouraged to do it, encouraged me to do it, citing uh, three main things, my love of dressing up, my love of showing off, and my love of words. And <laughs> it turned out that that was all you needed. No, I did actually go to um, uh, do my law conversion course, but I had worked as a legal secretary and in various other jobs that showed me that this, this world that seemed to take place um, in a sort of cartoon form on television was a very real, visceral, human world. And uh, I found myself soon enough on the Western circuit, which meant that on a day-to-day -day basis, I could find myself in courts as far away as Bristol on the Monday and the Isle of Wight on the Tuesday. And I did that for nearly a decade before um, I made the foolish career choice of having a baby. And because I had a baby, uh, going into court every day was uh, technically quite difficult. And I decided not to go back between my two children and it was during that time when I was not doing the demands of court every day that I, uh, that I wrote my book. And I wrote it, I suppose, to try and counterbalance a narrative that, would I, that I'd be hit with in any kind of black cab that I picked up or uh, in any pub conversation I had with someone at the bar, which was about what a barrister was, what they looked like, where they came from, mm -hmm. and what they did on the public coin. And I wanted, I guess, to counterbalance another narrative, which was a, a very glamorous woman in a taxi on the way to the high court wearing extremely high heels and red lipstick in a case where she managed to pull a rabbit out of the hat right at the last minute. Whereas the reality of most junior barristers' lives is dealing with a messy lot of various shades of gray and trying to lead people through that into the black and white of the law. So I wrote my book hoping, I suppose, to counterbalance some of those narratives and to try and shine a light a little bit on the people that were in the dock rather than all the showing off that took place at the front of court. Because the lives of the people that I found were complicated and messy and had their own backstory. And whilst it's of course true that facts are facts, how you look at those facts can color how you feel about them. So that 
uh, was the motivation uh, between behind writing writing my book, which was published in 2018 and came out in paperback in 2019. I, I, I should say, uh, Sarah, that I I, I love your your book. Thank uh, you. Despite man. your self-deprecatory introduction to yourself, uh, this book is not all about you. In fact, it's not about you at all. It's about your clients. And it's really just a book of word pictures of the complicated, uh, sad, very often messed up people who end up being processed through the legal system. And in a sense, that's very much what we're going to be talking about this evening. And I'll, I'll go over now to you, uh, William, uh, Bill Clegg, QC. Uh, your, your book is Under the Wig. Tell us a bit about it. Um, well, it, it's... Um a book I've written towards the end of my career. Um, I became a barrister in 1972. Um, I became a QC in 1991. And in fact, I've um, retired from practice at the end of last year. And it was very much towards the end of my career that um, Martin Hickman from Cavendish Press came to see me. Um, and um, I had not the faintest idea what he wanted. I assumed it was another press interview in relation to a case that i have been doing, which I know he'd been um, in the public gallery for a great deal of the hearing. It was the Rebecca Brooks um, phone hacking trial. Um, and when he came, he asked um, me to accept a commission to write a book. And I was frankly astonished. I couldn't think that anybody would be interested um, in me and not particularly interested in my career. And um, I was very reluctant to begin with, to, to accept the uh, challenge of writing the book. But um, what uh, Martin explained to me was that he didn't want me to write, uh, as it were, a standard autobiography, which I don't think I'd have been very interested in doing. Um, <clears throat> but he reminded me of a book I had read, written by a neurosurgeon called Henry Marsh, which became, I think, one of the um, it got into the bestsellers list, and I think it was a Sunday Times book of the week or something. And it was a brilliant book written by a neurosurgeon that explained neurosurgery to ordinary members of the public so that you could actually understand it. I mean, even I could understand it. Um, and he wanted someone to do the same thing um, to my profession, that, that of being a barrister. And I thought that was something that was quite worthwhile potentially to do, to explain to people um, how you became a barrister, um, how you became a QC, how you became a judge, how we worked, how we operated in what we call chambers, um, which is our offices where we um, share expenses, how we run our practice, how we work with um, clerks who set our fees and help manage our work and everything else. And um, I thought that would be quite a worthwhile thing to do. So um, I decided to accept the commission um, in the end and um, at their encouragement, and I think probably to make the book slightly more commercial, they wanted me to in interpose alternate chapters that were little cameos of cases that I'd done, um, which hopefully might reflect some of what I'd said in the other chapters. So that was the genesis of it. It, it was nearly a complete disaster because after about, um, six months. I don't think I'd finished the first chapter. And at that rate, um, I think I'd have been in my 90s before we'd have finished it. It was a thing that was left to the end of every day. And there was a question at about 8.30 when you'd finally put away the papers for the next day in court. There was a prospect of either a gin, gin and tonic or writing a bit more of the book. I'm afraid the gin won more than the book. So we, we had a meeting and I, I said, look, it, it is not working and, and I'm never going to do it. And can we sort of um, just abandon the whole thing and I'll give the money back? And um, they said, look, don't, don't, don't give up. You know, it's going to be great. Um, what about a ghostwriter? And that proved to be the saving of the, of the whole operation, really. Um, so we did get a, a ghostwriter who was somebody I actually knew. In fact, remarkably, it was somebody I'd actually defended. Um, who was a well-respected journalist in, in Fleet Street, who'd been prosecuted, not in the, the News of the World trial that I mentioned earlier, but in fact, in the Sun trial of the Sun newspaper 
employees that followed it, um, where he was found not guilty um, of having paid a, a public official for some news about a suicide in prison. Um, and he was um, out of work, um, having been um, effectively made redundant by the Sun after the end of the case. And um, he had a, um, a history of having been asked to do uh, ghost writing before. So it wasn't something that came new to him. And um, he, he would come and, and, and talk to me and prod me and tease out um, everything that he felt might possibly be useful. And the, the end result is the book um, Under the Wig. And um, I, I must say that I think I owe a huge amount to Martin for his um, persistence in pressing me to carry on with it. And John Troop for really sitting me down and making me talk about it. And I feel really a, a bit of an imposter to sort of have my name on the front rather than theirs. But I've enjoyed it enormously. And it's been huge fun um, promoting it, meeting other um, writers, going to literary festivals and book fairs and everything else. And I must say, I, I, I've enjoyed every, every minute of it. And if the book um, is something that some people do actually find worthwhile or um, enjoy, then so much the better. Um, but that's it. <laughs> I, uh, I too, um started out thinking I might be a lawyer and I read law at university <laughs> and I did all the usual things, you know, taught, contract, criminal law, international jurisprudence, all those things. The one thing I didn't do was court procedure, what actually happens in court. And I can't remember any of us at university ever talking about that and only since I've left university and gone into a very different career path have I realised how enormously important the actual procedure, the actual structure is, and how difficult it is, how challenging it is, how challenging it must be to practitioners, how much more challenging it must be to people who face the court procedure because they have been brought before the court. And, and it's that that I want us to move to talk about first. And I'd like to start by asking Sarah to, to Tell us a little bit about Support Through Court. It was founded, I think, in 2001. Why was it founded? What was the need that it, it, you, you thought it would meet? Well, Matt, those who run Support Through Court would probably be better off like, describing the history of it. But I've been to the offices and visited them. They're based in um, the Royal Courts of Justice. And they're an amazingly impressive organisation because they fill a kind of vacuum which has come about through some of the things that both Bill and I talk about in our books, which has been the cut in um, legal aid funding. Uh, they are there to guide people who are involved in civil and family cases through the law when they've got no legal representation. And what's quite interesting, I mean, I guess in my book, it goes over a period of 10 years and there was massive change even within those 10 years. Uh, because I saw an increase hugely in the family work I did in people representing themselves. And so the purpose and motivation of support through court is to try as far as they are able to, to kind of fill, fill that void that is not being filled with pre-litigation advice, which used to take place, and uh, legal aid funding for people who find themselves brought to court. And in civil cases, you can be, you're brought to court by another individual. It's not a case of obviously in a criminal, in a criminal context, being charged with a case or being a witness to a case. Uh, you are, you're commanded to go to court. And they are, I mean, what you said, that's so interesting, picking up on your um, point about not being taught the procedure. I mean, there's an enormous chasm between the theory and the practice. You learn that very quickly when you're, when you're on your feet and all of the various, you know, land law and tort and things that just fade, for, my, for me anyway, faded into the background, uh, would have been far better filled by some of the kind of the, the practice of it and the procedure of it. 
because you are asked to be, I write a little bit about this, you're asked to be a sort of mixture of all sorts of things when you're a barrister. Of course, you're asked to give legal advice and guide people through, but as you've already said, often your clients' lives are um, entangled with all sorts of other areas. And you're asked to be a little bit of a social worker, you're asked to be a little bit of a parent, you're asked to be a little bit of an interpreter, not through a different language, but in trying to coax out of people in their own words, what they felt at a particular point uh, that can be some time ago. So it's a, it's a kind of, it's a very, it's a very um, layered and complex and ever moving role. And uh, I think the aim, the kind of noble aim of support through court was to try as far as they are possible to kind of fill that vacuum, which has been created by the slashing of legal aid in the last decade. Bill, so, Bill can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the slashing of legal aid? There must have been an explosion in need for what support through court are, are doing. Well, a huge explosion. I mean, the real tragedy is that we need support through court at all. The um, help that they provide should be provided um, by government funded legal advice, but there's um, no point pretending that any government is going to start um, providing that in the near future. I think it is really a scandal that people are being placed in a position whereby they have to go to court without the help of any legal advice at all, just because they are um, unable to afford it. So you do get a position regularly, day on day in the courts, where those who have the uh, financial um, resources to be able to afford lawyers um, are properly represented. And those that through no fault of their own cannot afford it, don't. And that, that is a scandal. And in my view, if, if you're having a system of justice that you want to be proud of as a country, then it really ought to provide a, a level playing field between people who are appearing in court and not have those um, who are financially um, able to do so at a obvious and real advantage, just because they're able to pay for lawyers and the people they're in court against cannot. This is where support through court can help. Is it your, and, um, is it your experience, um, either, both of you, that um, the judges and, and, and benches of magistrates are sympathetic and helpful uh, to, towards those who come before them who, who plainly um, are out of their depth and trying to conduct their own defences. How, how, much, how much sympathy and, and, and assistance do they get from the court itself? Well, in, in my experience, the, the, the judges um, try enormously hard to help those who are unrepresented, but they're anxious not to appear partisan in a case. Mm. So the need for them to remain neutral, to some extent restricts their ability to help the unrepresented defendant. But um, I think universally the judiciary feel that people ought to get the proper legal advice. And if they can't afford it, they should be given legal aid. Um, I don't know if this is Sarah's view, but I, I, I find that the judges are really very sympathetic, but there's only so much they can do. And of course, they can't speak to a client in the sense of um, talking to them in, in a confidential way about their case, like a barrister can. A barrister talks to a client. What's said between them is secret. It can never be revealed to everybody. There's a strict rule of confidentiality. It gives the client confidence that they can speak to their lawyer and um, know that what they're saying will not be revealed to the other side. A judge can't do that, he's not allowed to. So I think there is a, um, a, a real problem there, but I think judges are sympathetic. I don't know if that's your view, Sarah. Yeah, it, I think it puts all judges and magistrates in an extraordinary position because you are asking a judge who has to decide the conclusion of the case to also help the parties through the case. And 
that apart from the fact that that is that is not uh, the job that they see themselves as doing that's not the job they applied for and and won uh, as bill said the effort to um, try and uh, try not to be partisan is incredibly difficult when you're also saying have you thought that you about asking these questions of the witness would you like to put to the witness the areas where he's accusing you of this or that i mean it's mad that is that's madness to get a judge to do it and the of course um bill is incredibly grand and senior so he sees the top half of it whereas the bottom half of it i mean i mean that on a kind of scale of seriousness rather than importance uh, is a magistrates, magistrates are volunteers. Magistrates are uh, not lawyers. They're volunteers who come into a case to, um, to, to do their civil duty. And they are guided, of course, by a legal advisor who is also balancing a hundred different balls in the air at the same time, because they are um, also run, running the management of the court and advisor magistrates. But in that scenario, uh, particularly in a family case, you have an extraordinary situation where you are asking untrained lawyers to advise people representing themselves on the law and procedure and how best to conduct their case. But I think, um, I think the thing which is uh, the, the most kind of um, insidious about that scenario is that in, as, as Bill knows and I know, these cases, involve a moment at someone's life, in someone's life, which they will remember forever. The consequences will be really far reaching. It's also the time that they are not thinking clearly because their adrenaline is spiking. They are panicking about the consequences. They are worried about how they're coming across. And that's particularly so when they, as you've already said, Matt, are in a are in a scenario that they've never known. They don't know the rules, they don't know the procedures, they don't know how this works, why people are bowing over there, why he's standing up and she's sitting down. So in that scenario, they're also trying to put their best case. I mean, it's they are they're of course set up to fail, even if um, even if all the allegations that they're trying to defend are completely true, they are uh, guilty of what they've been charged with or in, in a family or civil case, you know, they are not telling the truth. Even in those scenarios, this is not a fair fight. And what I think is, um, is so important about all this is that we, as uh, kind of British citizens, like to sit very smugly in our confidence in our legal system against somewhere like America. You know, we've all, we sit back and watch Making a Murderer or whatever television show there is and shake our heads and go, that would never happen here. I mean, that just couldn't happen here. And as Bill's already said, by the introduction of kind of means testing at a really low threshold, what is it, Bill, 37 and a half thousand, your household income has to be to, to get legal aid? I'm not certain what it is. It's certainly very modest. It's, 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 it's very modest. And uh, if you are over that, you don't get legal aid, you're on your own. And that of course creates a two tier justice system. And so where we have always been quite pompous about how, how great our legal system is, we've slipped immediately into something that we have always looked across the pond from and said, well, that's, you know, the, the rich get off and the, and, and the poor don't. Now, now you, you, you have both, I think explained um, beyond any need for further explanation what the the crying need is. Mm. How is it how is it met by support through court? You have centres, as I understand it. There are. Can either of you explain a little about about the actual mechanism by which you give this support? Um, as as someone who's gone in to see their offices, I know that. You, they are there to try and give as much um, kind of practical advice to someone who comes in with all their papers in disarray and they've got a hearing and or they've got one brewing and they don't know where to go. So uh, as, um, 
as I've seen, they have a, I think they have a caseworker that they're ascribed and they manage who are volunteers. I think they've got 750 volunteers in total. And they enable the, somebody to, to put their case together as best they can, but they can't represent them in the way that a lawyer could represent them. They're unable to do that, which is why, as Bill said, it's a shame that there's a need for them at all, because that should actually be done by a lawyer. Who are these volunteers? T tell me a little bit about them. Oh, well, uh, I think a lot of students volunteer there. But uh, again, you'd have to, I mean, it would be, they have, a, they have a sponsorship system called the Friends and Support Through Court, which is on their website. And their website's incredibly um, well put together. You can go and have a look at it and, uh, and donate to it, which will fund them to continue to do the work that they do. Uh, but a lot of organizations of a similar ilk are mostly bolstered by um, people who have people have a bit of free time on their hands, which tends to be uh, students or people who retired. And uh, as I understand it, uh, Bill, you can't uh, support through court, can't actually represent people. It can, can only just tell them which hoops they have to go through. Is, is that right? Um, well, certainly in the courts where I practice, um, they're not, they wouldn't be allowed to actually um, appear in court and act for somebody. But the support through court doesn't actually operate in the criminal courts, which has a sort of um, a really all or nothing arrangement. Either you get legal aid or you do it yourself. Um, and the support really in, in the criminal courts is um, even worse um, than it is in the um, civil and, and family courts. I mean, I sit um, as a recorder, which is a part-time judge, and um, often hear appeals from magistrates. So I'm often in the position that Sarah was talking about where I will have defendants in person in front of me who've got no right to legal aid, can't afford anybody, peering against uh, um, quite experienced barristers sometimes trying to argue their case. So um, it, it, it's very difficult. I think anything that support through court can do in, in helping them prepare for a case is obviously very valuable. But um, to be honest, it is no substitute for having your own lawyer and somebody appearing in court to act for you. Now, now there are such things as pro bono lawyers, aren't, aren't there? Uh, can, I, yeah. can support through court signpost people to, to pro bono lawyers? Well, um, there are um, a lot of um, pro bono lawyers um, practicing in this country. Um, there's the Bar Pro Bono Unit which provides um, people to conduct cases for um, um, deserving um, defendants um, or plaintiffs who haven't got the money to be able to pay for representation themselves. Um, they are often um, junior barristers or pupils, but um, some senior ones as well. And they will appear in Court often be before a tribunal where there is no legal aid available in many tribunals at all for people who are seeking a legal remedy. Um, and they will appear for them for nothing. And the um, unit is very much funded by the um, profession. And some of the big London solicitors firms will, as a matter of policy, um, have one um, or two partners who will do pro bono work for a period of time, um, often with um, legal support. I mean, in, in my own practice, um, I was a member of what was called the London List. Um, uh, cases from the Caribbean in particular and other British dependencies still come to London to the Privy Council for their final Court of Appeal. And um, many of these cases that I've been involved in um, are cases where the defendants have been sentenced to death. Now, even in a situation where somebody is facing the death penalty, there is no provision at all for legal aid or legal representation before the Privy Council. So there is a list of barristers of which I am one who do these cases pro bono, and we are supported by solicitors from the City of London who also 
act pro bono, and um, these people can be represented. And I've certainly got cases, I think there's, there's one in my book, in fact, um, of a case that I did where the conviction was quashed um, and a, um, a, a lesser offence substituted, which did not carry the death penalty. So um, it can make a... <laughs> I'm sorry about this. My <laughs> lecturer decided to speak to me. <laughs> I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> um, <I'll, laughs> I, I thought I was getting heckling for one of our... Uh, anyway, uh, I think I'd more or less finished what I was going to say. I, I was um, going to say, uh, Sarah, we, we're, we're talking, as it were, a little bit in the abstract, and I would, think, thinking of your, your book, I, I, would, I would like you to picture for us somebody whom one might come across outside a court facing, I don't know, perhaps somebody, a creditor is taking them to court for a debt or something like that. They will be distraught. They won't know what to do. Uh, an arm is put around them by somebody from support through court. What, what advice, what help, what practical help can, can such a person be given? Well, I mean, they're restricted in, in how much help they can give them because they, like we said, they're not lawyers. And I mean, the sort of arm around them is is an interesting choice of phrase because I, I mean, I imagine Bill must have found himself in similar situations, maybe uh, towards the beginning, but you are, uh, you're dealing with people in a very fragile, in a very fragile point in their life. I mean, particularly so obviously if on the criminal side, because um, they can be in prison already, they can be on remand and you have to go down to the cells and hand your stuff in and kind of wait. And then you're locked into the room with them. And it's all very, um, it's all very high octane. And so as well, your, your role as a, as a lawyer, your role is to try and get across an incredibly complicated set of advice in a way that is understandable at a really high pitched point uh, in somebody's life. And support through court can't, can't give legal advice. They can signpost to the myriad of different agencies. And that of course is another thing that as barristers, you often find yourself involved in this kind of mulch of different agencies, whether it's uh, working out how your client's going to, where, which prison he's going to go to because the prison van's already left and so he might end up at somewhere else and he's got a visiting order from his mum to the one he was at before. And it's, it's a kind of heinously complex cobweb and uh, as a layman going into it, it's incredibly hard to know which agencies do what. So I think support through court can do a very kind of practical thing, which is signpost who you need to go to, who you need to call, what they can do for you. But they can't give legal advice, they're not lawyers. So the arm around them is, is practical and is able to kind of fill a little bit of a void at a point where people, people need lawyers. But it is, I mean, it's a very strange, I mean, I certainly found, and I don't know if Bill did a huge amount of youth work. Did you, Bill, when you first started off? Yes, well, in, in, in my youth, I did a lot of youth work. <laughs> well, that's um, the thing. I mean, you aren't that much older than the people you're representing when you first like, start out, which is uh, worrying. Absolutely. And I mean, um, the, the other thing you've got to try to build in, into it, um, I think Sarah will agree, is you've got to try to get people to trust you. And often you're coming from a completely alien background to them. Um, and you can't really, I think, give um, very meaningful advice about tactics and, and how you should run a case unless the person you're speaking to trusts you and believes that you are really on their side as opposed to being just another member of the establishment rolling up and telling them what to do. And th that can be extremely difficult um, sometimes, particularly if there's um, language problems in particular, doing it through an interpreter is a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and e even if um, you are speaking the same language, it, it, if there's a huge gulf in age and um, one's position in life, as it were, then, then, then that, that, that is a challenge for um, the lawyer or whoever is giving advice. Now, I'm, I'm noticing at the bottom of my screen lots of, of our audience with um, thoughts, questions, suggestions, and I think this might be the moment, Katie, if you can, um, I can't see you, but I expect you can hear me, to, to put through to me uh, s some of the questions that uh, people would like our panellists uh, to address. So where shall we start, Katie? Do you want to pop something onto the screen for me? Hello, hello, yes. Um, so we've had uh, lots of questions in, so thank you everyone for sending those through. Um, so the first question is from Max Fitzroy Stone. Um, uh, I guess to both, both of the speakers, why do you think it is that successive governments have failed to recognize or prioritize the value of legal aid? Um, and secondly, what advice do you have for aspiring criminal barristers who will necessarily rely on it? Um, gosh, <laughs> right. Well, I, I think the, the, the position really is that um, the, the Treasury um, always hated um, legal aid because the, the Treasury um, operates on budgets. And, and um, Matthew will know more about this than me, but they, they give a department a budget and that's what they're allowed to spend. The trouble with legal aid is that once you decide that everybody who has been arrested should be entitled to legal representation, you have no cap on what you spend because the more people you arrest, the more money you have to spend. And so one did see for year on year um, an increase in the legal aid budget that the Treasury um, re really resented. And they felt they had no cap on it at all because it was just, in their eyes, running away with itself. The truth is that many more complex cases were being brought, many historic cases were being brought. They all required um, budgets to um, have the cases heard in court and for people to be defended. If you look at the Serious Fraud Office, they are prosecuting cases now that 30 years ago would never have been prosecuted because they would never have been able to understand them. And that does involve a huge amount of money for everybody involved to get those cases before the courts. And it's a very good thing that the City of London is regulated and that happens. Now, I don't believe that there are many votes to be had in we want to give money to criminals to defend themselves in court. It's not going to be a great vote winner in any election. And I don't believe that the government here really wants to have the best representation for people in court. They want to have adequate representation so they're not taken before the European Court of Human Rights on the basis that people aren't getting a fair trial. But that's about as much as they really want, in my view. And I'm afraid to say that um, as the cuts have bitten deeper and deeper, um, the sort of representation that people would have had in criminal cases 15 or 20 years ago is just not happening because um, experts that the defense would like to instruct won't work for the rates that are now being set. The number of hours that solicitors are given to prepare a case are grossly inadequate. They don't have time to do the research and look at witnesses. Um, and the barristers themselves are, are being um, having their incomes reduced to such a level that they are being forced to work, in effect, longer and longer hours to make ends meet. No. So it, 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 it's a grim picture. And it's not just the, the legal aid, it's, it's the court structure itself. It's the buildings are falling down. Now, Sarah, very, very briefly, because I'm anxious that there are so many questions <laughs> popping up on the screen and we must rattle along. But um, let, let, let me give you a moment just to address the same question. Well, I'd, I'd obviously echo everything that um, Bill has said and add, and add to it something else, which only really has been able to happen since there's been a, maybe a little bit of a generational change, but also since the rules on barristers being able to talk to the media and so on um, have been changed, which is that I don't know that we as a profession have done a massively great PR job on what we do 
because while we have, um, uh, while, while there has been kind of Rumpel and Judge John Deed and Kavanaugh QC and all of that uh, portrayed over and over again on in BBC in various series and whilst that narrative has continued to rumble it, it feeds into exactly what Bill was tapping up uh, earlier which is this idea of a of who a barrister is their motivations for doing it and and uh, and that's where the fat cat label has has come from now obviously if you find any criminal barrister and um, mention the words fat cat to them and just watch them explode and give you their accounts because most criminal barristers are particularly at the junior end are very poorly paid now uh, but i think this is one of the one of the reasons that i wanted to write the book and the secret barrister has obviously done a sterling job on trying to counteract some of the myths around it we're explaining that we take our salary from the public first. We need to explain why it's important. We need to explain its worth. We need to explain not just what we do every day, but why it underpins the country, why the trust in our court system, trust in our legal system is so important, not on a practical basis, not even for people who might never set foot in a courtroom, but in terms of the relationship we have with the legal system. So I think that in the past, as a profession, uh, we have all, like lots of professions do this, sit around in pubs complaining about it, but not necessarily explaining to the public the reason that we need your money, your tax paying money is for this. Mm. And we don't get it in our back pocket as the Daily Mail might have you believe. We don't take this huge lump sum of legal aid and head off to um, Magaluf with it or wherever. This is how it's spent and this is how it's earned and this is why it's important. Now, if I were um, a judge and you were both before me, I would be uh, putting on my most severe expression and saying kindly, both of you, do compress your remarks because we've got so many <laughs> questions. So, um, so Katie, what's the next question? Um, so we've got a question from Gabby Bladen uh, to both Sarah and Bill. Uh, are you able to briefly summarise the most memorable case that you've both worked on? Bill. Um, I think the most memorable case was probably um, defending in the first war crimes prosecution under the War Crimes Act, where I had to go to Belarus and um, do quite a bit of research and um, meet a lot of extremely interesting people, including the Attorney General of that state, who said to me that he couldn't understand um, why we had defence counsel in England. Surely they just tried to mislead the court. <laughs> Sarah. I think actually that one of mine was quite early on and it was a, it was a real reminder about um, checking, checking my privilege to use a current expression, but also checking my preconceptions about people. And it was a, it was a case in which um, although uh, the magistrates, because it was in the magistrates court, refused to say this, I think, I think that evidence was planted in a case and that's what it all suggested like. And it was a real um, reminder to myself to create the circumstances where my client could tell me what they needed to tell me to help them. And in the end, it, uh, it was a successful trial in the sense that they were found not guilty and the consequences had they not been would have been a, a long period of imprisonment and uh, that case will always stick in my mind as a real reminder which happens every now and then when you are you walk into court and all of your prejudices and preconceptions which we all have come up and then they are confounded so I think of that case often actually. Katie next question. Yeah, so a question from Meg Davies, uh, which is actually very appropriate because I know we have a lot of students joining us this evening. Um, so perhaps I'll direct this one to Sarah. Uh, looking back on your career, what advice would you give to students entering the le their legal careers now? I mean, I'm sure there's a book in there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think my advice now would be to... Uh, try as far as you are able to find a balance. And I mean that in every sense. I mean a balance between your work and your life. 
but also in a balance between your humanity and your kind of objective professional armor, which we all tread all the time, because I still think that this is a job like there are other public sector jobs that really challenge your armor. You have to wear one to do your job, uh, but sometimes it's easy to keep it on all the time. And it's easy therefore to lose the kind of openness with which you treat people. And I think that that is the skill that you have to walk down and to try and none, I don't think anyone gets it completely right, but you waver down this line a lot. And to keep those two things in your mind is, uh, I think would be very helpful to try and constantly think of balance when you're, when you're going into a very demanding profession such as this. Katie. Can, can I just offer one other quick um, piece of advice? Um, if you really want to do this job, don't let anyone talk it out of you, talk you out of it. Right. It's here. The, the yeah. best fun. It's the best fun you could ever have. And if you can go through life enjoying your job, then that really is a great thing to carry with you through life. And uh, if you really want to do this job, then um, stick at it. Quite right, Bill. I mean, I can't tell you how many people tried to put me off. <laughs> and I, when I was called in 2005, all you heard was the criminal bar will be dead. Everything will be in a solicitor's firm in Manchester. There'll only be in-house barristers. There will be no independent criminal bar, which is patently not the case. And although I think you need to go in with your eyes fully wide open about how much money you're going to make or not make and what the life is like, as Bill said, there are a few jobs that can match it in terms of what it brings you. Katie, next question. Thank you both. Um, so a question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, when trying to become a successful lawyer, would you say it's about who you know or what you know? And um, Bill, I'll direct that one to you. I'm sure it's nothing to do with who you know, because I knew nobody. Um, my, my parents ran a small flower shop in <laughs> South End on Sea when I became a barrister. Um, I'm not even sure it's what you know, in, in a sense. Um, brilliant academic lawyers and brilliant lawyers even don't necessarily become the most successful barristers. To be a successful barrister, you've got to be able to communicate with your clients. That is the most important thing. People come to see you, and often pay quite a lot of money to come and see you. They want to be confident that what you're telling them is the right answer to their question. And they want to have confidence that what you advise them to do is the right thing for them to do if they've got um, a difficulty. So um, I think that is really how you become a very successful um, lawyer, is having um, the confidence of clients, the confidence of your professional clients, and um, the knack or the ability to get the answer right. But Sarah, um... Doesn't that involve, as it, as it might for a, a consultant uh, in medicine, doesn't that sometimes involve pretending to a confidence that you don't feel, but that you feel needs to be communicated to your client? Absolutely. I can't tell you how many clients I've represented that wanted someone like Bill to turn up. <laughs> 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 who, who saw me and wanted Rumpole. Or, yeah. you know, who... who <laughs> In, in all the right ways, in all the right ways, <laughs> but wanted the wanted the kind of gravity of a man, mm. and uh, and you do have to work a little bit harder. I was saying to some students the other day that you dread for a long time the question, "How long have you been doing this for?" Uh, but I think. One of the things which was a great piece of advice, which a mentor of mine told me was when I was quite wide eyed and spangled about all these new barristers that I was meeting. And I said, how do you remember everything? And she looked at me as though I was very stupid and said, I, she said, I look it up. And she, she's now a QC, but she said, I haven't done a case where I haven't gone back to the law and looked it up. Even if I think I know it, I look it up. And so in terms of, what you know, you, you, you never take for granted what you know, you always look it up. And in terms of who you know, I think that it does matter who you know, but not in the way the question is maybe intended, because like Bill, I agree, 
your gift is winning over the confidence of your client very, very quickly under extremely tense circumstances. And that to an extent means having uh, met or seen or been able to put yourself in the shoes of people like your client. So having had a life, having a breadth of life, having met and uh, worked in different environments is hugely, hugely helpful, I think. This is so interesting. Katie, next question. Uh, so a question from Maria Santos, uh, which I'll direct to Bill. Uh, have you ever defended someone who you knew was guilty? And if so, how do you deal with that psychologically? Well, the, the answer is very simple. It's no. Um, we have a very strict rule that you cannot defend somebody who you know is guilty in the sense that they've told you um, he's guilty. You, of course, defend many people who you think the evidence may be overwhelming. But if they say to you, I am not guilty, then you have an obligation to defend them. And that's where the cabrag rule comes in, whereby a barrister has to accept that ex brief is offered in the um, area in which he practices. So you, you never do defend anybody who you know are guilty. And I've certainly done many cases where I might have read the papers and think this looks overwhelming. And if you ask yourself the question, you may, you may think, well, he's almost certainly to be found guilty, only to find the case falls apart. And it turns out he's not guilty at all. So we don't uh, go down that road, but the answer is a simple one. We don't do it. A barrister of my acquaintance, who um, must certainly not be named, coming towards the end of his career, told me that uh, at the criminal bar, in his whole career, he had only really defended two people whom he was sure were innocent, and they had both been convicted. Would you recognise that, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, <laughs> I don't think I do, because I have to say with, and maybe this is a, uh, maybe this when you're very, very senior and the sentences are extremely high and therefore a disincentive to entering a guilty plea, maybe this changes, but if, as Bill says, you read the papers and, or, as I have done, where you watch the CCTV and then your client turns up to court wearing exactly the same outfit that he's filmed on the CCTV wearing, and you say, this is, is this you kicking him in the head wearing the same outfit that you've come to court in? Uh, and you give them your advice, which is that you think that uh, a, a jury or the magistrates or whomever you may be appearing in front of is is likely to find them guilty. And of course the decision is theirs, but you give them the clear advice. Most of the time, if the evidence is so overwhelming that you think they probably did it, they often take the advice and plead guilty and, uh, and get a discount on their sentence. It is far, far more um, distressing in terms of going home and worrying about it to be in the situation as Bill describes of where you are absolutely sure, even if you thought otherwise to begin with, that your client didn't do it and that they are on an uphill struggle and that uh, from the moment they walk into the dock, you know that everyone's gonna be casting all sorts of judgments on them, but you are sure that there's another story going on that they may not want to talk about for lots of other reasons and that actually they did not do the crime that they're accused of, but they won't be able to get out of it for whatever reason it might be. That, that's, that's, um, that's more worrying in many ways. Well, I, I've, I've defended yeah. three people um, who are mentioned in my book, two of whom could prove conclusively um, they were innocent after fresh scientific evidence emerged, and two more who very nearly did so, um, in the sense that I'm completely certain that Barry George did not kill Jill Zando, and that um, Private Lee Clegg was not guilty of murder in Northern Ireland. Um, Colin Stagg was proven to be innocent of the murder of Rachel Nickell, and um, another man called Dallager was proved on DNA evidence not to have been guilty of another murder that's mentioned in my book. So I'm doing better than your friend. I've got four in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I have a, a, a supplementary question, if I may. As a member of parliament, I would often uh, hear constituents say that it was disgraceful that a defense that a defense counsel 
would represent somebody whom they knew to be guilty or whom they were almost certain to be guilty. You, as you've said, you never know, but they had a, a, a strong hunch. And I would try to explain to my constituents our adversarial court system of justice where each side makes the best case they can for their side and that it's left to a jury to decide. I'm not convinced that the British people entirely get that. Do, do, you, do, you, think, do you think we do? I, I think they do when it's properly explained to them. I think that if you speak to people who've been jurors, they do understand the mm. process and have a great deal of respect for the system. And um, I'm sitting this week as a judge um, in rather difficult pandemic times, as it were, and jurors are coming um, in an area where they were in tier two until recently to do jury service. And it's quite obvious that they are fully committed to the case that they're doing and take it very seriously and see it working. I mean, I think if you ask most people, do you believe that we should have a system of justice whereby people charged with crime get a fair trial? The answer is likely for most people to be yes. And if you say, well, in order to have a fair trial, people have to be defended, do you agree? Then the answer is also yes. Katie, next question. So we've had several questions uh, about the impact of the pandemic uh, on the courts, uh, I guess, as expected. Um, so I wonder if either of you could speak to uh, how, the, how the court system have changed um, and how you've had to adapt and perhaps uh, how you see the systems recovering or perhaps changing going forward. Sarah. Well, I haven't done any court work in these pandemic times. So um, Bill is far better placed because he has seen trials up and running throughout the whole thing, perspex screens or no perspex screens. Yes, I, I've sat um, as, as a judge, as a recorder, um, for three weeks um, since the courts have reopened. And the courts have gone to great lengths to ensure um, that the court rooms themselves are as safe as possible. Um, jurors now have perspex screens between them and the next juror. Um, between after every witness gives evidence, somebody comes in and sanitizes the witness box, the microphone. After each case, the barrister's benches are all sanitized. Um, and they have a lot of um, professional advice as to how to run the court um, in a way that is um, as safe as possible in these times. It does mean that cases take longer because Jurors have to come in one at a time, socially distanced to take their seats, um, as does the barristers, as do the prison officers and the prisoners and everything else. So everything takes a bit longer, but it is, in my view, um, really important that we try to keep the wheels of justice turning and to work through the backlog that has built up, particularly in respect of people who are in custody waiting trial, of which there are a very large number at the moment, and to deal with um, historic um, and recent cases of sexual, where um, sexual offences are accused, where complainants have the anxiety of waiting to give evidence, sometimes for many months. So I mean, it's the, important we get on with it. The backlog now, I mean, I remember not that long ago that I, I um, knew that trials were being listed two years ahead. Good Lord. We I mean, can you imagine trying to remember um, who hit who two years ago mm. outside a pub. I mean, two weeks ago, I tried a case that was two and a half years old. Mm. Mm. And it was a serious case. I mean, in the sense of it was a schoolmaster who was um, alleged to have um, sexually assaulted pupils in his school. And that took two and a half years to get to court. Katie. Invisible but all powerful, Katie. Are there many questions um, uh, still still in the queue? And, and shall we carry on with a few more questions? What do you think, Katie? Yeah, there are still quite a few questions coming in. So maybe if we do one or two more, and then we'll uh, give Sarah and Bill the opportunity to do their book readings as well. Lovely. Next question. Um, so there's been quite a few questions coming in uh, from students about uh, the best way to kind of access uh, employment opportunities, uh, contacts within the sector, work experience. Obviously things are changing a bit with the pandemic as we know, and there's been reduced opportunities for students. So perhaps Sarah, if you're able to talk a little bit about any advice you might have for students on the best way for them to proceed. 
Um, well, I suppose I've got two pieces of advice. Uh, one is a practical one, as far as you are able to in our strange new world, which is to see as much of the inside of a courtroom as you can. For all the reasons we've talked about, the massive chasm between the theory and the practice, and the language that goes on around it and the procedure will just bolster your confidence that you know what on earth is going on. Uh, but also I think that when you get into court and you see the barristers and sometimes the judges who are sitting in there, you will recognize people that look like you. And that is a huge boost as well because it will show you that other people have trodden this path and that you therefore can do so too. And the second piece of advice, I guess, is a, um, a paper application bit of advice, which was one that was given to me when I was filling out my applications for pupillage, which is the year that you do before you um, become a tenant. And I was talking to somebody who was a little older than me that told me that he put down beekeeping as one of his interests which was true he kept he kept he keeps bees and it was all that they wanted to talk about in the interview because after a while there's so many kind of debate societies and public speaking and mooting that you can talk about as an interviewer so having something that lets you into the window of who that person is what moves them who they are how they're going to tick, how they're going to do this very person, personality-based job is, uh, is, a real, um, is a real gift. And it's advice I followed and it worked, not with beekeeping, but with something else. And I think that is what you're so desperate for is to find out who the person is on the other side of the table, no matter how many qualifications, how many badges or stars they've got, let people into who you are. What was it, Sarah, the, the something else that you were able to talk about? I was living in Mile End at the time and there was a climbing wall that was just around the corner. <laughs> so I had just started rock climbing, which I was never particularly good at because the person I was doing it with was about five foot two and I'm five foot eight. And so whenever I fell off, she immediately catapulted straight to the ceiling. She was <laughs> bound to me by rope. So, but still, it, you know, piqued their interest. Katie, next question. Yep, so I think perhaps this could be the final question to both speakers. Um, how, as uh, to be successful barristers, do you look after yourselves, look after your mental health, uh, make sure you're both okay with your workloads and things like that? What, you know, what are the skills that are needed and the, the actions you need to take to be excellent barristers, but also uh, look after yourselves both personally? I think Bill's in the cupboard behind him, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, um, I, I had a I had a very strict rule um, throughout my practice um, that I would recommend to everybody. I used to stop work on Friday when court rose, and I wouldn't start again till Sunday evening. And I would take two days off every week, and then it didn't really matter how many hours I worked Monday to Friday, and they were often all the hours that there were. But you've got to keep some time to yourself and your family. And I think it helps um, to do two things. One is not marry another lawyer. Um, and secondly, try not to be so near to your office that you are tempted to go in on a Saturday. Um, I think that we've got a lot better at the bar in terms of understanding this. And even in the last five years, I mean, if if you mentioned mental health in a roving room 10 years ago, I imagine there would have been some eyeballs rolled and certainly the kind of adverts in council magazine for AA or similar alcohol dependent organizations were, I remember those. But I, uh, I think the bit learning, and it, you have to learn it, learning the ability to leave things and move on. And you can, you can do that. You can learn to close the chapter and move on to the next thing you are doing and not take things home with you, not, not allow a shadow to come back with you, um, no matter how difficult that is, is a skill that you have to practice because ultimately you do have to move on and you do have to go on to the next job. I have a, a very quick question of my own to 
uh, to both of you because I know there are a lot of students in our audience. Assuming that one makes it uh, through to the profession, how long as, as a young lawyer uh, is one going to be terribly hard up um, before one can even begin to hope to make a decent living out of it? it depends what a decent living is to you. <laughs> I mean... It depends. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. Yeah. No, no. You, well, you yeah. you've given um, us a history of it, so you know, Phil. Well, it, I think there are two things. It depends what branch of law you're in, to start with, because the um, progression through different um, areas of the law vary enormously, and it depends enormously on what set of chambers you're in as a barrister, and what firm you're working for, if you're a solicitor. Um, I mean. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are plenty of people who earn a very good living indeed from a very young age at the bar, even doing criminal work. Um, the great secret is um, to try to develop some um, private clients and, and to have some sort of um, specialization like um, health and safety, sports law, regulatory law, something like that which you can supplement your legal aid earnings with. Now, um, I'm not saying that's available for everybody, but um, it's a little bit like actors in, in a way, um, sort of 10% earn an awful lot of money, 90% don't earn so much, but even as a moderately successful legal aid barrister, you're actually going to earn after five years as much as a house surgeon in a hospital, as much as a teacher in a school who's head of a department, um, and as much as um, an accountant, certainly in a provincial firm. Sarah. I echo that. I think that um, supplementing what you do with areas that quite frankly, you may not be as interested in, your great passion may be criminal defence or legally aided areas of law. But I supplemented, because I'm in a common law set, I supplemented my practice areas with more lucrative areas and they were privately paying cases. So, um, I mean, I do remember doing a uh, no win, no fee, who hit who on a roundabout in Brighton or something and earned the same amount in an afternoon that I had in the entire GBH trial that I'd spent the week before doing. Um, and I know what I would like to spend more time doing, which is the GBH trial, not the who hit who on a roundabout, but it allowed me to supplement my income. So I think I completely concur with Bill. Don't be too focused on, or don't be too um, put all your eggs in one basket. Think about other areas of law that you might be able to do that bolster your main practice. Now, I wonder, Bill, whether you would give us a short reading uh, from under the wig. Right. Um, to some extent, this has been rather covered in the um, questions, but here we go. Legal aid. Two little words that set hackles rising everywhere, whether in a newspaper editor's office or the local pub. Everyone seems to have a view on the public funding of defence fees and it's invariably a negative one. But the simple fact of the matter is that without legal aid, we could not even begin to pretend we have a proper criminal justice system. If you believe, as I do, that everyone is entitled to a fair trial, it follows that every individual must have access to proper legal representation, regardless of their financial status. Legal aid was designed precisely to do just that, by paying for an appropriate defence for those with limited means. For decades, the system worked well. Courts were fully staffed, the Crown Prosecution Service budget was adequate, and legal aid defendants were represented properly. The barristers defending them earned a fee that was independently assessed to be fair and reasonable. This is no longer the case. The criminal justice system has been battered by a decade of government cuts. Barristers, along with solicitors, have borne the brunt. To be blunt, I think lawyers have fallen out of favour with the Treasury. The Treasury hated the fact that there was no cap 
to the legal aid budget. Every normal government department is given X millions of pounds to spend annually. But legal aid is unlimited because once you have offered everyone arrested legal representation, you must meet that promise. The more people you arrest, the more you must pay. Swinging cuts have been made to legal aid, as well as the Crown Prosecution Service and Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service. Between 2011 and 2017-18, the budget for the Ministry of Defence, which funds them, was cut more than any other government department, from 8.7 billion to 6.6 .6 billion. It was locked off a further 600 million by 2020. Court staffing has been reduced. In most court centres, there are not enough clerks or ushers for each courtroom, and they have to run two courts at the same time. The result is that often a judge cannot sit because no staff are available, and they must wait until someone is released by another court, so time and efficiency is lost. The budget for maintaining the courts has fallen. Stories of leaking roofs, toilets that do not flush, lifts that do not work and heating and air conditioning systems that are broken are commonplace. The courts themselves have not been painted in years, carpets are threadbare and there is a general feeling of squalor that you might expect in a developing country but curiously do not find there because respect for the rule of law demands that courts are properly maintained. Here in one of the largest economies in Europe that does not appear to be the case. Sarah, something from In Your Defence. Um, I've got a very short reading from a chapter that I have called Saba, which is uh, about representing someone in a family court who makes allegations of quite serious domestic abuse uh, against their um, husband. In the story that I write, the husband is represented, but as we've already talked about, in a lot of cases that would not be the case. And so when I talk about my opponent in this piece, my opponent is in person representing themselves against pretty serious allegations of violence made by their ex-partner. There is little, or oh, I should say also, I talk about a fact-finding hearing. A fact-finding hearing is basically like a trial within a family court, except there's no jury. It's the judge who's deciding whose version they prefer, essentially. There is little practical difference between conducting a fact-finding hearing in a family case and a criminal trial, except one. My family clients are not witnesses to their case. They are parties to it. They are parties even if they did not make the application or did not want to come to court. They are able and entitled to have a momentary shield or video link for the purpose of giving evidence. But how can this help them when in the time it takes to get to that point, they will have been forced to wait in the same queue into court, sit in the same waiting room, eat in the same canteen and sit in the same courtroom on the same bench from the person they accuse of abusing them. It may be that the only solace in this experience comes when the court believes their versions over their abusers. But when the judge or magistrates find my client's allegations proved and she folds herself into my arms like a child after a nightmare, or when I stand as a human shield as my opponent knocks over chairs or throws jugs of water, or rages at the unfairness of it all, it can feel a hollow victory. It is all too easy for the law and the lawyers to loop around and over a litigant in person, even when they're trying not to do so. Advocacy is not an art, it can be learned, but too often in these cases, I watch my opponent stumble through papers, emotion and frustration fogging their mind, then they sit down, defeated and confused, knowing they will later remember all the questions they wish they'd asked. After it has finished, I am left with the overwhelming sense that, even if I believe my client's evidence to be true, the hearing was not a just or an equal one, 
And that, as far as I am concerned, means that everyone has lost. Sarah, there is um, no better introduction to the work of um, support through court than the reading you've just given us. And I just wanted to give you a last word on, on support through court. Well, I just urge everyone who has um, logged in to see us today and to thank them for doing so to, to head to the Support Through Court website because on there you will be able to see not only more about what Support Through Court do with um, their 800 volunteers and their phone lines and their ability to kind of guide people through this awful time when they're unable to be represented. Uh, you will also find a link to how to become a friend of support through court, which would mean that your money, whatever donation you feel able to make, would make a huge impact to people caught up in this extraordinarily broken system that's grinding through. So um, anything, any donations that were made by people who are listening today will be gratefully received and make a huge difference to the lives of very vulnerable people who may have been recently evicted, maybe uh, in the process of trying to sort out um, contact with their children, uh, may have lost their benefits, and all the other um, uh, in incidences that people find themselves caught up in, sometimes um, through no fault of their own. So I would urge all those who are watching and listening to head over to the website for more details. And I think it's also my job now to hand over to one of the sponsors for this evening. My Chambers is the other sponsor, so hurrah for 3PB, but also to James Evans uh, at Our Family Wizard, I think is coming online now. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you ever so much to Support Through Court for giving us the opportunity to briefly speak to you today. Uh, my name is James Evans. I am the UK representative and professional liaison for Our Family Wizard. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Our Family Wizard is a co-parenting communication platform. It is a space for parents to communicate through during before or after divorce or separations proceedings. It is the number one co-parenting communication platform in the world. It has been court ordered in all 50 states of America and every city of the UK. Uh, we offer a plethora of different features to help families specifically going through divorce and separation in any way that you can imagine. Uh, we have different subscription services as well, but in light of the conversations that have been had this evening, we offer free accounts for any person who is on legal aid, universal credit, uh, benefits, welfare, if it's pro bono work, anything like that, they will always get a free subscription. If you'd like to find out more about Our Family Wizard, please visit our website, ourfamilywizard.co.uk. And as everyone else has stated, please do support uh, Support Through Court's fantastic work. We've been absolutely privileged to work with them for the last 18 months or so as partners. And it's been fantastic for me firsthand to see how these families really can be helped. Thank you to everyone for attending this evening and thank you to Support Through Court for asking us to join tonight. And thank you to our lovely speakers as well, who I thought on behalf of everyone have done a really fantastic job. Thank well, you. Our, thanks, our thanks to you, James, and, and to our family wizard. And uh, my thanks to Sarah Langford and William Clegg at QC. And of course, also to Katie Baxter for pulling all the strings together behind the scenes. And because they have not really plugged their books as shamelessly as one, one would have expected. Can, can I just mention that that um, that uh, Bill Clegg's book is 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 called Under the Wig, and Sarah's book is called In Your Defence. And thank you to all the audience. Good night. Good night. Good night.